Ceiling Unlimited. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. This radio show is brought to you by the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. Tonight's program is dedicated to the navigating men on the big Navy patrol planes, to the Army bombers, and to the jobs they're doing. Our planes are named after the stars, Lockheed and Vega, Orion, Electra, Lodestar, the Vega, that was Matin's plane, and Post and Gatti's. One Vega set a round-the-world record. It took another Vega to break it. Then Howard Hughes and another Lockheed did better yet, circle the world in three days, 19 hours, and nine minutes. The Lodestar, that was a commercial transport. Today it's re-engineered and armed to the teeth. We call it the Ventura Bomber. Today, the Ventura Bomber, the Hudson Bomber, and the P-38 Lightning are helping to write history among the stars. Gazing up at the stars, earthbound philosophers and poets used to say, Behold the enormity, how great it is, not to be measured, not to be conceived of. How small a thing is man. Astronomers catalogued the stars, and navigators put them to man's use. The navigator tells the ship where to go. He's just as important in the air as on the sea. Not so many years ago, a pilot could only tell where he was going by sticking his head over the side of his plane and looking for landmarks. Then came radio beams, locators, and nowadays, dead reckoning and celestial navigation, flying by the stars. Now, here's a navigator, name of Carl W. Jones. You haven't read that name in the papers. Not yet. Unless you happen to subscribe to the Hodgetown Daily Scimitar. An honorable mention went to Carl W. Jones for jackknife and hatchet trailblazing through McGrundy's woods. That's the last time Carl Jones' name appeared in the press, and that was some time ago. It's been almost ten years since Carl was active in the Boy Scouts. Mrs. Jones still has the clipping. Mrs. Jones used to get in the papers all the time. The Ladies' Forward League met Wednesday afternoon at the home of Mrs. Walter Jones on 513 North Elm Street. Bridge was played at three tables, after which delicious refreshments were served by Mrs. Jones, and the guests left with many an expression of gratitude for a delightful afternoon. Mrs. Jones doesn't save those clippings. Of course not. All the girls who belong to clubs or groups get their names in the social notes. There's nothing special about me, except I'm Carl's mother. Carl has a girlfriend. And her last moment of celebrity was the time she won a prize for best Eleanor Powell tap dance imitation at the annual A&P Wiener Roast. All hearts were captured by the cute and skillful dancing of little Lucy Carter. Oh, gee, I forgot about that. We have a very extensive research staff, Miss Carter. Why'd you pick on us? Because of Carl. Mrs. Jones, your son is a typical navigator. That's why we picked him. This program isn't dedicated only to Carl. Why not? Well, he got the fifth highest rating in his class in training school. He always got good marks in grammar school. A and neatness, always. At the grocery store, Mr. Needick said he never had anybody working for him so accurate or careful. Just give Carl a pencil, Mr. Needick used to say, and watch his dust. Never a mistake. Mr. Needick said he ought to be a bookkeeper. Bookkeeper? Mrs. Jones, wouldn't you say that helped him to be a navigator? I'd say it helped. Before we go on with the show, Mrs. Jones, have you anything you'd like to say about the war? No. Miss Carter? Mrs. Jones does a lot. She's fingerprint clerk at the school four afternoons a week, and she serves on the draft board Monday and Tuesday nights. Millie, that was the hired girl, went to work in the shipyard. Most women do their own housework, Lucy. I'm taking lessons in spot welding. Oh, Mrs. Jones goes to classes on first aid, too. Nutrition and first aid. Wednesday and Friday. Well, that doesn't leave you much time for your women's clubs, Mrs. Jones. All the girls are busy now doing things for the war. Thank you, Mrs. Jones. Thank you, Miss Carter. And now, ladies and gentlemen, about Mrs. Jones' son, Carl. I'll give it to you fast. Carl Jones enlisted in the Air Force. At the grocery store where Carl used to work, they said he'd make a good bookkeeper. Carl can add and subtract like 60, but he wanted to fly. And the truth is, he'll never make a first-rate fighter pilot. Jones? Said his commanding officer. Jones, I'm afraid that's about it. I want to fly, sir. If I can't fly... I told you Carl wanted to fly, and besides, there was all that expensive training he'd had. Carl hated to see that going to waste. Jones? Yes, sir? 
How would you like to be a navigator? A navigator, sir? Well, why all the astonishment? Well, sir, you've got to know mathematics backwards and forwards to be a navigator. I didn't make headlines in geometry. Can you add? Yes, sir. What Carl really meant was... And how? Make many mistakes at it? No, sir. Then you can be a navigator. We'd like you to have a try at it, Jones. So Carl took the pencil from behind his ear, so to speak, got himself a sextant and a Bowditch's practical navigator and Weems' treatise on aerial navigation and drawing instruments and precision dividers and several Mercator charts and a stopwatch and a few dozen extra pencils. He worked at it hard for 15 weeks, took his place beside a lot of other boys from the stores and offices and colleges of America, took his place beside a navigator by the name of Christopher Columbus, a trailblazer named of Daniel Boone, who never got lost, no, but he was bewildered once for three days, and a lot of other pathfinders. Carl learned to stand in the plastic glass turret of a bomber and take some sights on the stars and then make some passes with that yellow pencil of his. And lo, he knew where he was. It was magic. Carl Jones, fresh from wrapping butter and cartoning eggs, could intercept starlight traveling at 180,000 miles a second. Consult his almanacs, fool with his sliding scale, make a few passes with his yellow wand, and by Jupiter, he knew where he was. Holy cat, it... it works. Floating around in space, a thousand miles from anywhere, Carl could find out where he was by Jupiter and by Polaris and by Sirius and by Lyra by about 40 other stars, as well as the sun. He could tell where he was and where he was going and when he'd get there. By the lodestar, he could. And all at once, Carl came to an important realization. He found out he wasn't just a clerk in the big bombers he navigated in practice. He was the manager. He told the pilot where to go. Well, pretty soon, Carl got so good, they sent him to an air base in a jungle island in the South Pacific. It was so small that from 10,000 feet, it looked like a sprig of parsley. A nice location for a thriving business, though. Customers weren't long in coming. Men, our reconnaissance reports a very powerful enemy task force in our vicinity. The vital information goes up on the blackboard. Pencils come out. Carl Jones takes down his biggest order to date. Enemy bears 320... True distance, enemy disposition, two aircraft carriers, four cruisers, eight destroyers. Objective, intercept, and attack. So this is it. A far cry from the grocery counter to the plyboard desk of a four-engine bomber loaded with big trouble. Wind is from 60, 15 knots. Going to make an airspeed of 280. Track of 320, true. Uh, brings us out on the enemy's vector to the airspeed ring. Thus, Carl, the Jones boy who ground your coffee medium, now prepares to grind the enemy fine. Speed of 290. Means I'll be coming back, steering 142, making a track of 230 miles. It comes to 43 minutes anyway, before they intercept the enemy fleet. Then, for 43 minutes, and exactly on schedule, rendezvous. The enemy under the wings. The bombers dodging the ak ak fire, watching for fighters make their runs. Pieces of black rip through the cabin walls. Machine gun bullets wind through the ship. A port engine is hit. The enemy fighters swarm all around the bomber. And then from the bombardier... Bombs away! Let's beat it out of here! So they beat it out of there. And with machine gun slugs spanging and humming through the ship, Carl Jones makes some vital corrections for a crippled engine false course to throw off pursuit ships who might find the secret landing field, the change in wind direction and velocity. Very routine, very. Now, let's see. 
145 degrees, making a track of 235 miles. Unperturbed, the yellow pencil moves across the board. The grocer's clerk makes his calculations. In other bombers, clerks and college boys and coal miners hand up slips of paper to the pilots with estimated times of arrival calculated correctly almost to the second. Theme song for pilots, show me the way to go home. Nightfall. The bomber has shaken its pursuers. Her course has changed. More calculations for the navigator. Look at him. Less than six feet tall, with his head among the stars. Stands there with the sectant to his eyes and puts the universe to use. Puts the giants of heaven to work for him. Outside his plastic turret gleam stars. Bigger through the middle than our entire solar system. They work for him. Carl Jones, whom you used to know, peers at them and steers by them, homing. For he wears the universe like a wristwatch, balances it like a pencil, orders and uses it like a navigator. Estimated time of arrival at base, 23.27. There she is, boys. We're home. <laughs> Something went wrong. I don't know how it could have happened. My estimated time of arrival was off. Twelve seconds. ex grocer's clerk takes four-engine bomber out to sea, engages enemy, attacked by enemy fighters, hit by flak, engine knocked out, change of course necessitated, wind changes, brings four-engine bomber home again to a one-cent postage stamp somewhere in the South Pacific. Wonders where he dropped 12 seconds. Earthbound philosophers and poets gazing up at the stars, used to say, Behold the enormity, how great it is, not to be measured, not to be conceived of. How small a thing is man. Americans, this is 1942. Look up, what do you see? Enormity, the glittering cosmos. And Carl Jones, he's up there in the middle of it. He's doing a great job. That's what the Air Forces say. I always knew he would. How about you, Miss Carter? You're going to marry him. I think he's wonderful. Surprised? I shouldn't be. He hasn't changed any. I guess he was wonderful before. We're just finding it out. Miss Carter, I don't want to embarrass you, but you're wonderful, too. Carl up there in the stars thinks you're wonderful. And you, Mrs. Jones? I dare anybody to make a joke about an American woman's club now. While we're about it, is there anybody who thinks it's funny or dull to be a bookkeeper? Your boy Carl may never make the headlines, Mrs. Jones. But he's proving an important point. It concerns the dignity of man. He doesn't look very small up there compared to the universe. He looks very big. night. Please listen next week. Till then, good night, Americans. This program has come to you from the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporations of Burbank, California. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.